Mark. It's finally the moment. We've reached the Bridgerton episode of our season because we can't talk about TV without acknowledging the much anticipated return of Netflix's popular period drama. Does it mean anything to you when I say you are the bane of my existence? Well, I I hope that you're quoting something. (laughs) Look, I've already seen the season about three times for work, I swear, but we're going to have to schedule a viewing party, clearly. Yeah, I'll I'll check my calendar. Okay, fine. Um, (laughs) But in the meantime, let me get you up to speed. So the show is based on Julia Quinn's popular Regency era romance novels. And after a triumphant debut that had fans obsessing, I can't stress that enough, Mark, obsessing, Over the love story between socialite Daphne Bridgerton and the brooding Duke of Hastings, the series shifted its steamy focus in season two to Daphne's eldest brother, Anthony, played by Jonathan Bailey. And he's navigating his reluctant feelings for a new woman in town, Kate Sharma, played by Simone Ashley. So tell me, what has she done? She has done nothing. It is you. You have made this match impossible. But I am leaving for India. And it is not far enough. Do you think that there is a corner of this earth that you could travel to far away enough to free me from this torment? I am a gentleman. It's very much got that enemies to lovers vibe. You know, Anthony first sets his sights on Kate's endearing younger sister, but really finds himself pulled to Kate's forces. Kate is witty and headstrong and focused on her family's needs more than her own, and he can't help but be smitten by it. And the tension becomes really, really palpable. Okay, now now I think you're selling me on this. <laughs> well, you'll hear all about it in today's interview with Simone Ashley. She joined me to talk about on-screen representation, getting acclimated to Bridgerton mania after starring in sex education, and what she wants to see next for Kate and Anthony. But first, she walked me through the very important work of building that smoldering chemistry with Jonathan Bailey. Hi, Simone. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, of course. Thank you for having me. So let's dig into Bridgerton a little more deeply. I mean, the chemistry in the season's central romance is so crucial to the magic of the series. And Kate Mm -hmm. and Anthony have a completely different kind of love story. The psychological intimacy is much different. So tell me, like, what the chemistry test was like between you and Jonathan. Like, it must be, I would imagine, such a weird thing to essentially have a job interview where executives, you know, decide if they think audiences will want to watch you two yearn for each other. So, I mean, how do you remember that, (laughs) that experience? Yeah, I think, um, so I remember I did a few self-tapes and before I knew it, I I went to Oxford Studios to do a chemistry test with Johnny. And um, Mm. it was very like, we were just in a little room and we were sat next to each other and we had Shondaland on Zoom and the audition camera on us. And we just did a few scenes together. And um, chemistry is such a funny one to articulate because what really is it? But I think um, Johnny and I, he, for one, is an incredibly generous actor, so it was effortless to react off him and work with him. Um, and he's obviously gorgeous inside and out and very emotionally intelligent. And I think we both um, really had a deep and parallel understanding of our characters and what they wanted and what we wanted to bring to this relationship. Um, but I just remember in the chemistry read, really feeling it, and I really believed it. And um, it gave me such confidence What were the scenes you guys had to do? We had to do the horse riding scene from episode one where Kate and Anthony first meet. Um, And then we did a scene from the library where Kate's up at night and there's a thunderstorm and he comes in and they both discover like, oh, your father died as well. Like I share that Mm -hmm. memory and that feeling. This is my father's library. These books were some of his most treasured possessions. How did he die? He was stung by a bee. My lord, I I am so sorry. I... To see a great man felled by such a small creature, it was, um, it was humbling. 
Absolutely. And there was a third scene. I think it was from the races where Kate kind of educates him and shuts him okay. down on like why that horse is going to win and places her bet. And it was odd because we were just sat on chairs next to each other. We weren't on the horses. So it was just very <laughs> stripped down and it was all about just the eye contact and us reacting off one another. Were you a fan of the romance genre or even period dramas? Like, I feel like I've waited my whole life to get a call about joining something like Bridgerton. Oh, really? With the amount of times I've watched Pride and Prejudice or like mm -hmm. Emma, were those things that like were on your radar before or was this like a new world to you? They were on my radar. The romance genre, definitely. Um, I, I'm, I'm such a romantic and I, I love romance and I love when it's um, like very poetically portrayed in movies like Pride and Prejudice. Period dramas, um, I think honestly, not so much purely because I never imagined that a woman who looked like me could be a part of one. And then mm. Bridgerton came along and completely changed my mind and um, changed the whole narrative as to who we can see in these dramas. Well, both the book series and the Netflix drama have a big and loyal following. And we saw, you know, what a phenomenon the first season became and the way it propelled its leading couple to notoriety. So I'm curious for you, like, what was that like walking into? Honestly, I didn't really address or even experience that um change of notoriety um, and what how big this show was until it started premiering, until we started mm -hmm. doing press for it. Um, my process of getting the role was very, very fast. It was within two weeks and then we were like straight into rehearsals or horse riding training or fittings and filming. So I was very out of my head and very invested in the characters' relationships and the writing everyone would say the safest place that they felt was being back on set because it's away from all the noise and it's very simple. We're just together creating something, working together, being actors, being creatives. Um, and that's how I felt whilst filming the season, even if I was a new member, a part of this cast. So, yeah. So when you're not on set and you're getting a sense of that noise, I mean, what's that like? Because, you know, some actors struggle with, you know, the media intrusion that comes with their rising profile, like how has it been for you that transition and adjusting to it? Um, I think it's a journey and I think it's one that um, you can only really understand whilst you're experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the warm response that we've all received um, from the fans from young women, from young Indian women who have seen themselves represented on screen. I think it was two parts for me. One being, I think for a long time, I was like, I want to normalize this. I want to normalize the fact I'm a dark skinned woman playing a romantic lead. I want to be taken seriously as an actress. But then it was also surrendering to the fact that, yeah, we're still on this journey of normalizing these things and I'm a part of that movement and I have to own that and I am somewhat of a political statement and that's a positive thing and then um and I found I I found it very liberating surrendering to that and I'm very mm. proud of it um and the second half of it I guess is um I you know I was a younger sibling um I always looked up to my peers um, and the majority of my career has been auditioning and trying to get my breakthrough role, exploring myself as an artist. And now I'm, I have a platform and like a louder microphone than ever before because of Bridgerton. I really learned um, that I, I am representing young women and I can influence young women. And um, it's, it's a really nice feeling. Well, let's dive into Kate for a bit. I mean, she's this feminist character who is very independent and headstrong and is outwardly unapologetic about being single at a certain age. I was wondering if we'd meet again. So you might discern if my wit is acceptable, my man is genteel. But you were eavesdropping. It was hardly an effort, seeing as you were proclaiming your many requirements for a wife loud enough for the entire party to hear. You take issue with my requirements? I take issue with any man who views women merely as chattels and breeding stock. None of that was meant for Viscount you. Viscount Bridgerton, yes. 
When you manage but to find she's, this part of you know, as you mentioned, she's someone that does yearn for love. And she's also someone who feels responsible, you know, for taking care of her family and is, you know, somewhat tormented by the pressures of the time that she's living in. So for you, like, what about today's culture helped you understand Kate in the world she was living in? Um, I think what I loved about Kate when I when I first started reading the scripts um, was how honest to herself she was. I mean, that's debatable because obviously within the story, she isn't honest with her true feelings for Anthony. Mm -hmm. But I think she was honest in the sense of her, what her values were. And she wasn't interested in the playboy or in the hot guy on the street that all the girls want. I think she ran much deeper than that. And she wanted um, something with much more value. And she was very dedicated to her family. She's very, uh, and she, I think she's a little bit sassy in that sense, because I think she knows her worth. She knows that she is incredibly smart, that she is observant, that she doesn't have to be performative, that she's very self-realized and can keep her cards to her chest. And I like people with that sense of mystery because I think you have to earn their trust to get there. And um, I think that's what we're seeing in society today. Women who are very self-realized and know what they want are being so celebrated now. Um, and I think that's what's amazing about this show is even though it's set in the 18th century, um, it's it's voicing what's happening in modern society now. And I think there's a line, Eloise says it in one of the episodes, she, you know, she says, what if I want to fly? What if I don't want to marry and do all this stuff? What if I want to fly? Why must our only options be to squawk and settle or to never leave the nest? What if I want to fly? You know who is flying? Lady Whistledown. She is up in the sky. A brilliant woman of business who falls the entire ton whilst pocketing their money. Imagine the life she must lead. The independence. And I remember reading that and watching it on screen, and I think it, 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 that was said for all the women in the show, all the characters, and also in women's today society, because I think that's the narrative now. Women are saying no if they don't want to. Women are saying yes, yes, I can, if they know that they can. And it is wing spreading and it's so liberating. Um, and that's what I loved about Kate. And I also loved that she wasn't perfect. I think the strong female lead is an amazing thing. And it's normalized now, I'd like to think. Mm -hmm. It's happening more often. I think what's amazing about Kate is she was humanized and she's not always perfect and strong. She makes mistakes. She is vulnerable. She is on a journey. I liked portraying that because I think that's something in today's society that I think we can get lost in being so headstrong when I think having that emotional intelligence and connection to what's happening here in your heart mm -hmm. you know it's, it's just as powerful because Kate she she doesn't do all the music lessons like the other debutantes or reads all the books or knows all the languages but she has such a strong emotional intuition and heart and that's what I loved about her and that's kind of what I wanted to portray to a modern day audience. Well, because that was my question for you, which is like, tell me like what you have come to understand about both what goes into playing a romantic, you know, lead, but also what you're interested in playing in a romantic lead or what you're interested in um, expanding sort of the, you know, portrayal that we see on screen. Yeah, I liked that Kate, it, it took a minute for, for us to earn her trust and for us mm -hmm. to figure out her story. Um, and I think as a romantic lead, I liked that it was a slow burn, even with Kate on her own and together with Anthony, to understanding who this woman was and what she wants, what she's doing a part of the society. And in, in a world like Bridgerton, where different characters are finding their romance, Kate, it was kind of a bit of a question mark. How does a woman and a character like this, who comes in very hot, how does she end up surrendering to love and finding her love? When do we see her happy moment? Um, and I, I loved that factor of playing it, um, playing her as a romantic lead. To be honest, I think as a dark-skinned woman playing the romantic lead, that was amazing for me. Um, 
Because I do think dark-skinned women are beautiful and they are the object of everyone's desires and they are deserving of love and they are romantic and they are, um, for a better word, sexy and endearing and all of those things that all of us feel and deserve. So that was incredibly empowering to play. Um, and But also to not do it in a performative way. It wasn't on the nose. It wasn't... Um, it wasn't, you know, written out in every scene that like, this is who she was. She was just normalised. And I feel like many women of different heritages can relate to her. And I I just wanted um, the, the smart, self-realised woman to get her love as well and to not be seen mm-hmm. as a negative connotation or as something mm-hmm. difficult or w- w- all of those things that all of us women have heard I wanted people to really root for her and to understand her journey. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to see more women that look like me as a romantic lead. You know, the Kate character in the book was originally written as white. Like, did you worry that they would cast you a South Asian woman, but make you like a stereotypical white character? No, I mean, for one this wasn't um this narrative wasn't put into the the season that we saw but i remember one of the audition sides there was a storyline that very much was about kate's heritage and mm. um and, and her background and her history and we saw a few flashbacks and it was all um exploring kate's time in india and as soon as i read that i was like okay cool like we're really going to acknowledge that this is you know, a conscious casting of an Indian woman in this show. Mm. And so that gave me confidence. But also, as soon as I was in the costume fittings and the makeup tests and the wig fittings, there were so many different nuances and influences from Indian culture. The jewel tones, the jewellery, the Haldi scene, which was just incredible um, to bring that to screen. The makeup, um, the hair... And I I had a voice in it as well. Um, Whenever I was like, oh, you know, Kate thinks she might be going back to India at this point. Maybe we should have her hair in more of an Indian kind of way. Um, Mm. Shondalyn took it on board and listened to me. Um, So I wasn't worried. I I was very, I'm very grateful to have entered this production with that much confidence. Um, And to be honest, I think I wouldn't have allowed myself to have been a part of something where I felt a slight insecurity in that sense. Well, you know, a third season of Bridgerton has been confirmed and we know that the sort of central couple or relationship uh, will be Penelope and Colin. But where would you like to see sort of Kate and Anthony's story go from here? Are there aspects you'd want to delve deeper into now that, you know, the fairy tale union is behind them? Yeah. So on a more lighthearted note, I definitely want to see Kate and Anthony really enjoy their love story. I think there was a lot of drama in season two and a lot of, you know, time where they couldn't just let go and be in love with one another in their honeymoon period, so to speak. So I'm excited to see that and to see them be more playful and to be in love and to be, you know, now I call you man and woman, destined to be together, husband and wife. (laughs) I think in season two, you see Kate quite isolated Mm -hmm. and she's quite afraid to depend on others and to ask for help. So I want to see her more in a sense of community and family. And I'd love to see her and Anthony have a baby. That'd be the cherry on top. When do you start production? At the end of the month, so end of June. When you're in this whirlwind, has there been much time for you to sort of sit with yourself and think about what you want to do with this voice that you've developed? And yeah, you know, yeah. I've always looked up to a lot of actresses that um, have taken control of their careers. For example, Margot Robbie or Zendaya, um, and they're producing and creating their own projects. Um, and I want to do that. And um, it's not really a daydream anymore. When I got this role and this opportunity and this platform, I set up a production company whilst we were filming last year. I I said to myself, I want to do those things. I want to, I don't want to wait for the perfect project to land in my lap. I think um, I'm smart and I've got creative ideas and I can bring people together and bring ideas together and 
you know, many different kind of projects that I want to be a part of in so many different genres. Um, I sing quite a lot, so I've always wanted to use my voice, whether it's in storytelling and in a musical movie um, or something that's more athletic, like an action film or something that's um, a completely different character that no one's ever really seen myself in before, all of those things. But also, um, as I was saying, like, it's not just being an actress. I I do want to be a part of this movement of change of what we see on yeah. screen and in the industry. And, um, you know, um, studios and um, corporations, yes, they have the power um, to help these projects come to life. But who's who's actually driving that? And it is the people of the world. It's what people yeah. want to see, what people want to pay money towards or what people are invested in. And um, I think as soon as that clicked in my head and I understood that, I just wanted to do everything, whether it's um, start up my own makeup line for dark skinned women or um, I have such a deep love for fashion um, and expressing myself in that way and collaborations in that way or music or storytelling, producing a film. I think the possibilities can be endless if you really let it be and if you put the hard work in. So when I'm not filming or I'm not in the middle of a project, I'm always thinking of other things that I want to do. Well, when you're, you know, a 27-year-old woman in entertainment, you have to worry about how women react to you, how men react to you, how studio executives react to you. For you sort of coming to learn that, how has that made you think about what you want to do with something like your production company or how you want to, you know, ensure that you're moving in the right direction or in a, in a direction that is comfortable for you and will be comfortable for others? I think of two things when you ask that question. And the first one is, um, it's less of worrying what people think about me, I've learned, um, because it isn't really about me. Um, when you're in this industry and you have notoriety, for example, what Bridgerton has given me, you are the source of many different conversations depending who you are. So for me, a woman of colour, it can be conversations on feminism or um, misogyny or racism or colorism or diversity or, um, you know, uh, anything that's surrounding a young woman. Um, so anything that I do that might move the needle and people have an opinion on it, I really understood that it's not really about me personally, so to speak, not all the time anyway. It's about the conversations surrounding what it means to be a part of all of this, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, the other half of it is I, I just want to relate to people. I think there is something deeper than superficialities like race. Um, there's something deeper than race that connects us, for example. And I I want to create things that people can see themselves in, no matter what they look like, how old they are, what gender they are, where they come from, how they were raised. It's all a feeling. When people remember how you make them feel, people remember a feeling after coming out of the movie theatre or watching a series. Um, and I, that's the only way that I can really translate it. I want to be able to relate to people to have that sense of community with the fans watching or the world watching. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me happy when I wake up and go to work. That's why I want to do it. When you're starting out, there's this pressure to, you know, try to fit in and not necessarily embrace mm -hmm. what makes you different. But for you, when did you feel like, okay, I want to play characters that explicitly have Indian heritage. Like how long before you felt like this doesn't pigeonhole me, it makes me feel seen and I want more of it. Yeah. Um, I think it, it is a journey and I, I think it's something that I, I'm 27. I'm still very young and I feel like every three months I'm, I'm growing and changing and learning so much more about myself and my position in this industry especially since the show coming out. I think um, a few different things I can think of. One being, um, I think accepting the fact that being a woman of colour on screen, it is a political statement. I think it was Mindy Kaling that originally said that. And I do reference that a lot because it, it was a penny drop moment for me. 
because for so long I wrestled with, I want to be seen as an actress. I want to be taken seriously. I don't want to only go for culturally specific roles. I want to do everything. I want to play loads of different characters. I want to do um, all these different things. And then, and I can still have that, but then it was also owning it and being like, well, yeah, I'm a part of this movement and I, I've got so much um, ability in me to help make a change and to do what I want with my career. It's a good thing. It's not something to wrestle with and to to run away from. Mm -hmm. I think all the opportunities surrounding Bridgerton um, that come with being in a show like this, all the press we've had to do, the red carpets I've had to do, I have such a deep passion for fashion and makeup and, mm. um, you know, I, I, it's such a joy to step out uh, as a dark skinned woman and have my skin out to be, to look red carpet ready and to, to feel as bright as the other women that I've looked up to in all of my time mm -hmm. and career as an actress. It's fun. It's your, it's your crown moment. It's been a journey. And I, I'd like to think the more that I've understood it and owned myself and the more my self-belief develops, it just, it's more and more fun. But it's hard work. And I think when you put the work in, then you can really enjoy it. Have you been able to connect with Mindy? Like, I obviously see the sort of words of encouragement she leaves on your Instagram. But yeah. like, you know, she knows what it's like when you have all this attention on you and people are sort of treating you like as the representative of South Asian mm -hmm. actresses. Like, did she give you any advice on how to handle that? Or how have you come to learn how to handle sort of being considered the voice, embracing mm -hmm. that while also sort of reminding people you're one person you don't represent everyone yeah yeah I mean that's great advice thank you um, <laughs> I haven't had a one-to-one -one with Mindy yet that I, I am um scheduled to be speaking with her soon which I'm very excited about mm -hmm. I bumped into her before at events um and I it was yeah like words didn't really have to be said it was when I bumped <laughs> into her, I was just like oh my god I can't believe we're finally meeting and gave her a massive hug. Um, and, you know, Mindy's her own person. And um, I, I for one, wouldn't want to put pressure on her to be like, oh my God, you look like me. Like, you have all the answers. <laughs> Tell me everything you know. Because I'm sure course, she was on course. the same journey. But ultimately, I would love to work with her. I think she's an incredible writer, producer, actress. I love everything that she's been doing from Never Have I Ever to The Mindy Project to Late Night. Um, so yeah, that would be a dream to do something with her. Cause I think regardless of being two um, South Indian women, um, I think just as two creatives, I think we could make something quite special. More with Simone Ashley after the break. If you're enjoying this interview and want to keep up with future episodes, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's pick things up where we left off with Bridgerton star Simone Ashley. Before Bridgerton, you were already part of the Netflix family with your role in sex education. You play Olivia, you know, one of the most popular teens at Mordale Secondary. And you were working steadily before that, but what was going on in your life when that role sort of came your way? So sex education, it was it was like perfect for me because I, I was a series regular on the show. And um, oh, I have the best memories mm -hmm. filming that show. We were filming, I was on that for nearly three and a half years. We were filming in Wales. And um, it was an incredibly special cast because we all kind of grew up together. It, it was for the majority of us, our first big job on a big Netflix series. We were just stepping into this industry and we all grew together over the seasons. It is such a diverse cast with such diverse voices, um, but we still just all related to one another and became very close friends. And I, I was living in London um, and working on sex education. And I, I think it was quite an innocent time in my life, really. I, I was um, a budding artist as I am now, but I was doing things that I probably can't do now. Um, I had much mm. more anonymity with that show. And um, I was working really hard for my next thing. 
how did your parents react to what to sex education was? yeah um, they loved it. I mean, we just we just don't speak about it. We don't speak about all <laughs> of the probably stuff, the good the way. embarrassing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, vomiting. Yeah, I puked on his dick, all right? He says I shouldn't give BJs anymore, but if I don't go down on him, then he won't go down on me. So what do I do? What do I do? Mm. Well, human sexuality is far more varied than you might realise, and... Each person has a history of unique experiences which translates into their connection with a chosen sexual partner. Or indeed, partners. What? I think some <laughs> parents might acknowledge it and make a joke about it, but I think my parents get it. And they were just so happy for me and very supportive and proud of me. And um, I think everyone loves that show. Um, it's, it's so funny. The performances in it are amazing. I'm so proud of my cast in it. So yeah, my parents didn't, they didn't really comment on the on the weird stuff, on the embarrassing your, stuff. <laughs> your bubblegum skills are unmatched, I have to say though. Thank you. Yeah, that um that was an idea that was inspired from um Roller Girl in Boogie Nights. I love that movie. And um in season one, I remember saying to Ben, our director and exec producer, um let's give something preppy and very John Hughes to Olivia. Um, mm. And obviously I wouldn't, I wasn't able to just roll a blade on set all the time. So I thought of bubble gum and um, yeah, I remember buying a whole packet of bubble gum on the way to set and I put it in and I was like, look how big I can blow a bubble <laughs> and then cut to spending six to eight months of the year for three years, just chewing bubble gum all day on set and just blowing massive bubbles yeah. Oh, and it's funny when you're in it, it's like a part of the work, but now I've got distance from it and it's out and I watch it. I'm like, yeah, that was, that was an important part of the character. Yeah. I, well, like I would imagine, you know, simulating sex on screen is maybe one of the most difficult aspects of your job, but like in what ways did sex education help your comfort level with performing intimate scenes? It, it really, it kind of stripped it to the basics of what it is to simulate a scene. And it was such a great platform moving forward in my career, like for shows like Bridgerton, where there are a lot mm -hmm. of intimate scenes. In sex education, we had like a sex intimacy workshop um, where we completely broke the ice. And, it, you know, anything that was said, it was the most embarrassing or the most vulnerable, but it was a safe, intimate space. And we we explored... Um, the movement of different animals to kind of portray mm. different paces or different sensualities or like how sensual something could be. For example, we looked at how snails mate. And when snails mate, they actually produce a plasma that intertwines. So oh, wow. if it was a really sensual, slow kind of scene, we'd be like, oh, it's like the snail and it's super like the plasma, like falling like honey. So we would make it about that or... Mm how dogs made or chimpanzees made it's very like fast paced and a different kind of style so mm -hmm. this kind of scene we're going to make it very funny and quirky and just like silly and like let's think of like this animal so we would we would kind of focus on the other things around it and then treat it like a dance and make it very mm -hmm. character driven and the great thing in sex education was we had amazing intimacy coordinators and also we're portraying 16 year olds it's that kind of scene that experience weird things that happen in awkward. these spaces. Uh -huh. Yeah, awkward, embarrassing, uh -huh. but also very normal. Uh -huh. um, and then you, and I think it just gave us all like the practice and experience on how to be professional on a set like that. And you learn that, you know, as well as you're making sure that you're protected and feel safe, you're doing the same for whoever you're working with and your co-star. And um, you really have to trust one another. Um, and I definitely found that within Bridgerton. Yeah, I was curious how it was to sort of develop your voice to express any concerns you might have before a scene or your like make sure your comfort level was being considered. Like, did you find yeah. that uh, it came easily because of this? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. And I think I've always been quite confident in that sense in 
both my sexuality and speaking up in a professional environment about what mm. I need. And we were very heard and taken care of. On Bridgerton, we, even on sex education, we had rehearsals and conversations. But for Bridgerton, I remember we set up a Zoom with Johnny and I and the director and our intimacy coordinator. And we wanted to find out what's, what makes sense for the scene, what isn't performative, what's truthful, what's authentic, all these different ideas. And then you get excited about it. Then we do have the conversations of, no, I'm not really comfortable with that. Feels a bit vulnerable for me. Can we make sure that this is in place? Or, yep, I'm down for that. Actually, can we have more of this? Because I think it's great for my character. So you just have that conversation. Um, it's a team effort. Um, so, yeah, I felt, I felt very comfortable and very confident and, and safe. I want to talk about your own teenage years now for a little bit. Like okay. you took you you took an interest in musical theater but then pivoted mm -hmm. to screen acting. Like when you made the switch, how how did you hope your career would unfold or or what expectations did you have of how your career would unfold? Um I've always had a very scary sense of no doubt. I mm -hmm. I never for a second doubted anything I I always resonated with the movies and the performances that I watched and was just like I want to do this and mm. I think I have what it takes and uh, for the right reasons I think that I can pick up a script and have creative ideas I think I'm very musically inspired and that helps me with my work and I just I just went for it I started out when I was like 17 and I was like, well, you've got like 10 years to like get this going. So you better like put your foot on the gas now. And that was it really. I didn't really have any expectations or, um, oh, this is what I want to do or what I want to do next. It was just um, knocking on a lot of doors, always, you know, just believing in myself. And when I did have roles, just learning, soaking it in and learning as much as I could. And musical theatre, I think, gave me a lot of discipline. And there's something very classic and archaic about musical theatre. Um, so, yeah, I, that gave me a nice belt to walk into it all. I love both musical theatre and film, but film for one, I fell in love with it and just wanted to be a part of it in any way possible. Where do you think that self-assurance comes from? I, I think I've always been a bit of a dreamer. And since I was younger, I always... Um, I, I had a bit of a hard time in high school, but um, as, as many of us have, and mm. I, my way of getting through that was, I, I always wrote letters to myself, especially mm. on the new year and be like, okay, this time next year, this is gonna happen and this will happen and whatever. And it was never like, you know, I wanna be a millionaire. I wanna mm -hmm. do this or I want this or that. It was always, I wanted my voice to be heard and I want to be able to express myself as an artist. And I, I've always been such a dreamer in that way. And I, I, I'd like to think that I get what I want reasonably. Um, and yeah, I've always loved working hard. I think my mum raised me in a very disciplined way to just, you know, always have good values and work really hard. My parents, you know, being Indian and coming to London and raising me and my brother, they, they gave up and sacrificed so much. Mm -hmm. So I think... Many people from heritages outside of the Western world understand that, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, how privileged and lucky we are because of what our parents did for us. So I think maybe it came from that. And I think I always, I, in high school, I, I knew it was a very transient thing. I, I didn't think that high school was forever. I always mm -hmm. knew that there was going to be another world and that sense of freedom to do whatever I want. Um, I've always been a bit of an adventurer and I curious about the world and people. So yeah, I don't know where it came from. I think I just, I love it. I'm very competitive and I love a challenge. And if someone says, no, you can't do something, I'm like, well, I'm going to give it a go anyway. Sure, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you come from a family of engineers, doctors, accountants, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like, but your parents have been supportive of you pursuing an acting career. But do you think they get it? Like, was there a moment where they were like, oh, you're on the right track. We don't have anything to worry about. So I, th I think sex education was the beginning of that. And then Bridgerton, obviously, 
I think they were like, yeah, we get it. And you're on the right track and <laughs> you're, you're fine. So yeah, it took Bridgerton, um, <laughs> but they were always very supportive. But I think I just always kept it quite private, to be honest, because mm-hmm. I, I didn't want them to misunderstand. And then for, for me to take that personally and doubt my own skills or whatever it is that I'm on, I kind of wanted to do the work and be like, see, like, this is what I'm up to. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, I get it. I don't know if this is because I was the youngest that they kind of gave me a bit of leeway and they were like, yeah, yeah, she can like do her thing. And (laughs) they kind of, you know, humored me. I was very stubborn. And I think I removed myself from the noise of other people potentially doubting me just because they were protecting me by moving out. And I Mm -hmm. moved out very, very young. And I was like, I really want full independence on this. So tell me about moving out of your household so early. Like what, what was that about? And like, what were you seeking from doing that? And what was it like just not, you know, being home at such a young age? I loved it because I, I, I grew up in a quite a small town um, that was relatively close to London. Mm -hmm. So I did have the freedom if I took a train or a car to London for a few hours, I could experience the city um, I have family from Ojai, California, so I visited California quite a lot. I, I was raised on such amazing music, lo- a lot of rock and roll, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones, Bob Marley, The Doors, The Doobie Brothers, all these things. And I just remember having great music that influenced me as well. Um, and I was just always on the road. And I did a bit of modeling and that kind of helped me pay the bills and have that, you know, this is what I'm doing with my time when I'm not living at home. I don't think it was necessarily the most healthy thing to do, but it's got me to where I am now. I wouldn't recommend it on anyone, but I think I've always been incredibly stubborn in that sense and just always wanted my independence from a very, very young age. And, you know, being an Indian girl, yeah, there there were aspects of that culture where women especially are expected to marry at a certain age or to do something. And any time that conversation came up, it frightened me because mm. I didn't want anyone to have control on my life and what it is I wanted to do. Um, I didn't want to get married at a young age. I didn't want to be restricted. I, I had such self-belief in my heart that I was ca- capable of all these things and I just never wanted anything to take that away from me. So, yeah, I mean, it was. I loved leaving home at a young age, <laughs> which is a horrible thing to say. How old were you when you left? 15, 16. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I still ask my mom how to properly cook chicken and I'm in my 30s. So like <laughs> you leaving at 15, I'm just like, I don't know what I would, I would have been like so, such a baby about everything. I was a baby. I think maybe I thought I was an adult, but I was a baby. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, I just, I, I think, you know, I'm, I may not be as like the most well-read as some people or like have all these skills and speak five different languages, much like Kate, to be honest. But I think <laughs> I, I learn quickly. So that was something I think that just kept me out of trouble most of the time. <laughs> How much of, you know, that decision to leave your home early and sort of strike out on your own, How much of that do you think comes from knowing that your parents didn't really have a life where they could choose whatever they wanted? Like, how do you think that set you up for what you wanted out of your life? I think I understand that more now because I'm 27. But when you're 16, Mm -hmm. you don't really humanize your parents. Mm -hmm. I, for one, didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I didn't really fully understand how much, you know, how privileged I was, the life that they'd kind of given me and supported me on and that they didn't have options like me and that Mm -hmm. they didn't, you know, they, they were restricted and they did have to sacrifice a lot. And, um, I understand that more now. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, I saw that struggle and I saw that restriction in them and other people that I observed as well. And I just never wanted that for myself. I, I wish there was a better way to say this, um, because obviously I'm, 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 this is for what this is, but I think yeah. there is a sense of magic that I have um, within my imagination. And I think things are possible if you really, really manifest it and believe it. And I um, I remember saying this to Johnny, actually, when we were having a drink when filming last year. 
And I said, like, oh, I've always had this, like, Disney sense of imagination in anything that I do and the approach to my work. Um, and I, I never want to lose that because I think the day I lose that, I'll be like, oh, well, that's yeah. it. Uh -huh. I probably uh -huh. should get a normal job now, which is, you know, not to say a normal job no. is a bad thing, but, you know, I don't think I'll, I'll lose it. I, I think I'd like to always stay in touch with that side of me. Well, to build on that, I mean, what sort of roles are coming your way since Bridgerton? I mean, like, how are you thinking about the moves you want to make from here? Yeah, um, so I'm very excited about this year. There's a lot of things yet to be announced um, and things at the end of this year, particularly that are coming out. Um, and uh, some things musical um, where I'm using my voice, um, which I'm very excited about things I weren't expecting for someone that looks like me to play, which was, which has been really nice. Um, so many different things. I, I, I've always been inspired by Uma Thurman and Kill Bill. Always wanted to play that badass female athletic kind of character um, where I've had to train for a role. I've always loved like high adrenaline sports, like horse riding. So Bridgerton was perfect. Um, I, I love cars. I love race driving, um, like Formula One. So I, I always wanted to see um, a female in the driver's seat and not playing just the girlfriend. So there's something in that genre without saying too much that's uh -huh. um, in the works. Um, I've always wanted to play an AI, like an ex machina, because I, I think to see a, a woman of color, not to make everything about race, but the, the story of an AI is how can we relate to yeah. an artificial intelligence? It's not about how you look, it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've always wanted to play. And then it's a, it's a role where you have to explore the, the physicality. Um, and I, I, you know, I was really, I'm really excited about that. And, you know, I've, I've always been very, as you can guess, influenced by Disney movies and that sense of imagination. So this is yet to be announced, but um, there's going to be like a voiceover movie, which I'm really excited about. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a dog. So, and if any dog lovers listening to this know that you make a voice for your dog and yeah. you can like, you know, impersonate an animal. So I'm excited to be doing things like that. <laughs> and obviously Little Mermaid, um, that I got before Bridgerton. Um, so it's a very small role, but I'm excited to see that movie um, coming out next year. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff within the movie space um, and in the fashion space that's yet to be announced this year that I'm very excited about. What role is it in Little Mermaid? Is it a role I would know? Like, or is it like they created a new character? They they created like an ensemble is all I can say. Yeah, okay. it, people weren't supposed to know that I'm in it, but I think it got leaked. So <laughs> yeah. that's that's all I'm allowed to say. And you've about. already shot it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I got okay. the call for Bridgerton actually when I was filming it. Um, yeah, which was which was a very memorable experience. Oh my goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, fans of sex education were obviously disappointed to learn you wouldn't be returning for the fourth season. Was was it strictly a timing issue? Timing issue, yeah. I'm I'm so grateful for sex education and both Bridgerton, but I think after three and a half years of um, playing Olivia, I I just felt I wanted to give Kate a chance as well and be invested in her and her journey in season three, amongst other projects surrounding it. it wasn't an easy decision because mainly because I love working with that cast so much, and I'm going to really miss them and spending time in Wales with them. But maybe I might go and visit which will be really fun. Because <laughs> do you think you have unfinished business with Olivia? Like, how would you have liked to see her story progress? You know, we saw her sort of reveal uh, her story about sexual assault. Like, what would you have liked to sort of tie up mm -hmm. with her? I really want, I wanted to see Olivia and Eric have more scenes together and have a mm -hmm. friendship. Because I'm very close with Shooty anyway. Um, so for that biased reason, but also I just think they would have been so funny together because um, they're very contrasting. Um, I wanted to see Olivia um, maybe break away from the untouchables a bit more because she already is kind of on the fence with them and she is kind of playing this role of the cool girl who chews the bubble gum and like acts all cool and stuff. Um, but she's actually very goofy and um, vulnerable and cringeworthy and awkward um <laughs> which I love about her so yeah and I think maybe it would have been nice to see Olivia kind of take charge maybe be the head of 
um, the head of uh, the year or something, the head of sixth form or like something like that. Um, but someone actually said because of the bubblegum thing, Olivia was destined to be a dentist. Because <laughs> um, whenever we rapped, they'd be like, oh, let's hope they cover your dental because your teeth are going to be rotten by chewing all the bubblegum. I was like, oh my God, maybe Olivia will be a dentist and it'll be like <laughs> one of those things. Well, before I let you go, I, I saw your Jimmy Kimmel appearance and I need to know more about your new venture into tattooing. Um, for yeah. our listeners who don't know, you bought a tattoo gun during COVID lockdown in LA and tattooed a sphinx on your ankle and you yeah. also tattooed your co-star. So tell me how tattooing your co-stars went down. What did you tattoo on people? Tell me everything. Yeah, so I, I was actually in Seattle last week and um, that was like a kind of shoot where I was like, I was working with some music artists and we spoke to their management and it just wasn't going to work timing wise and I didn't have my kit on me. But that's kind of how it works. Like it's my offering <laughs> to people. <laughs> Maybe it's a way of people pleasing, I don't know. But I, I think it's really fun and it's a nice memory. And, you know, if I find a connection between people when I'm working with them, then I, I'd like to just do something silly. Like, and if they're happy to, if, it, if it's someone that's into tattoos, then yeah, I'll do something that's really kind of not too recognizable and small. Um, but yeah, who have I tattooed? Quite, I can't, so many people. I nearly tattooed my makeup artist. So many. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've only tattooed myself once. Um, but it'll be mainly like the glam teams I'm working with, very intimate relationships. It wouldn't just be anyone, um, but maybe it could be. Who on the Bridgerton cast has gotten tattooed by you? No one on Bridgerton's no, but... got a tattoo. Yeah, it's not. I I really want to tattoo my makeup artist, Jessie. She's got loads of tattoos and we were supposed to, I was going to do a B on her. So I think this season that's good. I'm going to have a bit less, a little bit more flexibility with my schedule on Bridgerton. So I think I'll, I'll use my time to... Yeah, do a tattoo on her ankle of a bee or something. <laughs> I can tattoo you one day. Maybe if I'm please, in LA at the same time please, one day. Just yeah. a giant do you have micro- tattoos? No, I've never gotten one. I'm a scaredy cat. It's more of being Oh, scared. really? Yeah. But that's the fun yeah. in it. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a little cat then. <laughs> a little cat? Maybe, yeah, a cat. Like, what What even sparked it? Were you always into tattoos or...? I was like, yeah, I'm not covered in them. I've got three tattoos and I think that will be my my limit. Um, I don't know. I think lockdown just made me really <laughs> do some wild stuff. I did tie-dyeing, banana bread making, all the, working out, reading books, all of the things. And it just got to the point where I was like, what do I do next? And yeah, I don't know where it came from. All I know is please keep a track of it on Instagram if if you make any sort of yeah. tattoos on the Bridgerton set. Idea. Please, okay. please, please. Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, Simone. Thank you for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Thank you. The Envelope is a Los Angeles Times production in association with Neon Hum Media. It is produced by Navani Otero and Liz Sanchez and edited by Hiba El Arbani and Lauren Rabb. Sound design and mixing by Scott Somerville. Neon Hum's production manager is Samantha Allison. Their executive producer is Shara Morris. Special thanks to Matt Brennan, Jasmine Aguilera, Shawnee Hilton, Helena Howe, Kayla Bell, Patricia Gardner, Dylan Harris, Brandon Sides, Sophie Chap, Amy Wong, and Chris Price. Till next time, I'm your host, Mark Olson. And I'm Yvonne Biaviev. We have another episode coming your way this week, an interview with Jillian Anderson, who stars as Eleanor Roosevelt in The First Lady. Be sure to look out for it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.